happy Sabbath, everybody. Hello. Happy uh, Sabbath. Sabbath. We're going to continue with some lessons from Luke. There's, there's some good lessons in there. I like Luke. Luke's one of my favorite. Yes. Uh, this one begins in Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> now it came to pass, verse 1, afterwards that he traveled through all the land. That's a long journey. City by city and village by village, preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. So they left everything. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, wife of Shuzza, a steward of Herod, and Susanna, and many others. Many women were with him through all these journeys, city by city, village by village. And these women were ministering to him from their own substance, from whatever they had in their ability to give, whether it was from their own wealth or just their own skills. They were there as well. It wasn't just a bunch of male disciples. You know, some people sometimes think, well, he traveled with his disciples, mainly 12. No, there was lots. There was more than just the 12 male disciples. There were other male disciples as well, but the 12 were called apostles, but there were other disciples as well. And there was many women. They were all involved in this ministry. And these women, they were disciples too. We're disciples. You know? <clears throat> Sometimes that's overlooked. That's overlooked, is it not? You always think of hearing about the disciples, just those 12 men. No, no it wasn't. There's many more than that. And these women are specifically mentioned here because they did an awful lot of good things. You know, I, I couldn't live without my wife. I suppose I could physically, but what, what she does in my life, I, I couldn't do for myself that way. She goes above and beyond. You know, imagine what these women did for Jesus in his ministry. It's curious to know, because I've never heard anybody pause and, and comment on that very often, or if at all. <clears throat> and in verse, verse 4 here, And as a great multitude was assembling, it's a lot of people, and those who were coming to him from every city spoke a parable, always in parables, to the people. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the road, and it was trampled upon, and the birds of heaven devoured it. Another seed fell upon the rock, and after it had sprung up, it withered, because it did not have any moisture. Another seed fell among the thorns, and after sprinkling, or springing up together, the thorns choked it. And other seed fell upon the good ground, and after springing up, produced fruit a hundredfold. <clears throat> And when he had said these things, he cried aloud. He didn't just, didn't just say it so his disciples could hear. He cried aloud so the great multitude could hear, saying, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. <clears throat> Who was hearing the word, really? And why did he state that? The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. My answer is in verse 10, a bit. Let's go there. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? See, the disciples didn't really get that parable either. <clears throat> and he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, 
but to the rest it is given in parables, so that in seeing they may not see, and in hearing they may not understand. Why? Why speak to the people at, in, in, at large in general in parables like that, so that they could see but not see, and hear but not understand? Was it meant for some people to understand? That's true. It's meant for some people to understand. Well, what kind of people would understand? <clears throat> to give an idea, because um, that saying comes from Isaiah. It comes from Isaiah chapter 6, as a matter of fact. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> And we'll read, in, starting in verse 1, we'll read the whole chapter here, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. In the year that King Uzziah died, and this was a good king. This was one of the better kings. I then saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah's having a vision here. He's seeing God in his temple in the year that King Uzziah died. A good king dying sometimes means one that follows is not going to be as good. And bad times could happen. And it stood, and, ab and uh, above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the one who cried. And the house was filled with smoke. An awesome vision that Isaiah is seeing here. Then I said, because he's being shown God, the throne, and these wonderful creatures called seraphim, Isaiah says about himself, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah is humbled in the presence of God and declares that he is a sinner, and he lives amongst sinners. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your sin has been taken away, and it has been atoned for, because he confessed his sin before God. He could see that he was a sinner, and he knew that he lived amongst a great many people who were sinners too. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? God is looking for someone, a volunteer, so to speak, to do his work. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. I will do it, Lord. And he said, Go and tell this people, you hear indeed, but you do not understand. And you see indeed, but you do not perceive. This stubborn people. This people that should know God, but don't. This people that resist God. And the more they resist, the more they are not able to receive him. The more they resist, the more they are not able to see him. <clears throat> the 
Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return, and be healed. That doesn't mean purposely making them not understand. They're doing it all on their own, this people. Because they'd rather do what they'd rather do. They don't want to follow God the way God is asking them to. <clears throat> because their heart is not right. They see but don't see. They hear but they don't understand. And God is telling him, God is telling Isaiah in this sixth chapter here, I am sending you out to give this message, to preach my word, but the people will not hear you. Now Isaiah, <clears throat> just being a man, a humble man, going out and preaching to his countrymen, He knows that they won't receive him. God has forewarned him that they won't. So he won't be discouraged, thinking that he's failing God. Can you imagine having this vision? The words spoken to you in vision. God asking you to do this mighty work. And then you go about doing it. And you don't seem to be accomplishing much of anything because nobody is listening. How would you feel? Would you feel like you're failing God? <coughs> God is telling him, you indeed tell these people this message. That is your job. But don't be discouraged because they won't listen. But you do it anyway. It is a witness and a warning to these people. These people who are stubborn. These people who refuse to listen. These people whose hearts are so hard that they will not soften and welcome their God. <clears throat> and Isaiah says to the Lord, Lord, how long? How long will they not listen? And he answered, until the cities are wasted without inhabitants, and the houses without a man, and the land is ruined, and utter desolation. Until everything is pretty much fallen apart, and they're desperate. And until the Lord has removed men far away, and the desolation in the midst of the land is great, but yet, in it shall be a tenth, there will be some. And it shall return and be consumed like the terebinth, I'm not sure what that means, and like the oak being felled, yet its stump remains, so the holy seed shall be its stump. <clears throat> Christ will return. There will be some who believe and remain Isaiah is preaching that about his nation. And great calamity befell them. And it will befall the whole world too. <clears throat> so when Jesus is saying this to his disciples, it's for the very same reason too. Because he knows when they are sent to preach and proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God, many will refuse to listen. <coughs> and this parable of the sower, you can see, there's four different groups of people. Only those who truly have the right heart that welcome that seed into their heart 
and let it grow and flourish and be watered. Understand. The rest whose heart is not right, God does not open their mind. They have to first change their heart. Just like John the Baptist preached, repent, change yourselves, and then be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, and your minds will be opened and your sins will be washed clean. Your heart has to change first. And we can see in this world there's not a lot of people that are willing to do that, are there? There are not a lot of people. <clears throat> but it will happen in the end times. And when God does finally establish his kingdom, then the people will turn to him in great number. But some will still refuse, which is very sad. Jesus proclaimed out to the masses. He said loudly, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. <coughs> He's calling upon all the people. He wants everybody to repent. And he's saying to them, if you have the ear to hear and the heart, then you will hear it. You will hear it. <clears throat> now he goes on to explain this parable to his disciples. The seed is the word of God. It's a good analogy. The seed is the word of God. You receive initially a small witness. You encounter somebody in your life. You hear a message on the radio or you read a booklet or something. You see something, something, a seed of the Word of God comes into your life. How do you receive it? How do you receive it? What happened to us, all of us in this room today, and those who could be watching later on? First encounter the true seed of God, the Word of God. What went on in their life that made them transform? <clears throat> and those seeds that fell by the road are the ones who hear, initially heard, but the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. They heard it, just like this multitude here. This great multitude who assembled. They all heard him speak. But they weren't ready to hear it. They weren't ready to hear it. And of course the devil deceives the whole world, Revelation 12:9. And as long as he's deceiving the whole world, you know, it's easy for people's hearts not to be right. I've never met anybody who will admit that what they're doing is wrong. People's paradigm, their own personal paradigm, paradigm is a set of values and, and principles that you hold to be true in your life that, that you make decisions on. <clears throat> An atheist has a different paradigm than a, than a person who believes in God. Completely different. You, you can see that as a, as a huge contrast. Their paradigm would have to shift dramatically. Likewise, a a believer in God, their paradigm would have to shift drastically too in order to not believe in mean, That's it's quite a feat to have to go the other way. But it does happen sometimes. <clears throat> the first seed didn't affect their paradigm, not a whit. Not all. Not at all. Because the devil had deceived them. And they weren't ready to switch paradigms. And those that fell upon the rock are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. This is something new. This is something I've never heard before. This is great. 
I want to hear more. But these do not have any root because there's conditions. There's conditions on it. They believe only for a while and in times of trial when things aren't as rosy or if it compromises their life just too much. Compromises their life too much. Well, I just can't do this because I'm too busy doing something else. I'm not going to change that. And you certainly don't expect me to give up Christmas, do you? That's a big one. That's a big one. Now, what about Sabbath? That's a big one too. That's a big one too. The Sabbath is a, is a big trial for some people. It makes them fall away. But they were initially filled with joy. But their joy got snuffed out because it compromised their life. And those that fell into the thorns are the ones who have heard, but are choked while pursuing the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and do not bring any fruit to maturity. <clears throat> These people weren't under any trial, necessarily, but they were so involved in their own lives, their own gain, prosperity, or whatever it is, they just didn't have time. They didn't have time. God was inconvenient for them. Does that sound familiar too? Being a Christian is inconvenient to my life. I can see how being a Christian can be inconvenient to your life. Because it, it is. It's inconvenient to a worldly life. It's very inconvenient. And those that fell on the good ground are the ones who, in a right and good heart, because that heart was ready to receive that seed, hear the word and keep it and bring forth fruit with endurance. And these are the people that were following him, that gave up everything to follow him, city by city, village by village, helping him. And all those afterwards, likewise. <clears throat> Parables, they bring a lot of meaning. They bring a lot of meaning. Sometimes much more so than just plain out stating it. You can get a good image, a good picture. And reading through a parable one time, you may have some understanding of it, and another time you read through it, you could have a deeper understanding of it. I've read through this parable many times, and I'm getting a deeper understanding of it every time I read through it and think about it. Well, that's a good thing. Those who have the right heart, they produce a huge harvest. Verse 16 and no one, after lighting a lamp, <coughs> covers it with a vessel. Why would you do that? It makes no sense. Or puts it under a couch. That makes no sense either. You put it on a lampstand, so that those who are entering may see the light. And that's what those who have the right heart, the ones who are converted, the ones who follow God, that's what they do. And everybody around them who are in darkness, which is the world in general, sees them. They stand out. They're different. They may not understand it. They may not even like it. A lot of times they don't like it because the light that you shine reveals the sin in their own life and it makes them uncomfortable. They'd rather not know. They'd rather not know. They'd rather remain in darkness because the truth about themselves is too hard to bear. And they deceive themselves. 
They would rather stay in the dark. Because there is nothing hidden that shall not be made manifest when the light shines, nor any secret that shall not be known and come to light. <clears throat> Those who don't have the right heart, they don't want that light shining. But it will one day. Everybody will stand before God at some point in time. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him shall be given. But whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, shall be taken from him. And that's what happened in those, the other three examples. Those who aren't really listening, they're not practicing his will and his word, even what they have will be taken away. Matthew 10 for a second. Just want to turn there for a minute. This is in relation to this light that you are. That you put on a lampstand so that the world can see, the people in the darkness can see. In verse 22, and you shall be hated by all for my name's sake, because the truth of God shines through you, and they see it and they don't like what they see. But the one who endures to the end, that one shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, escape into another, for truly I say to you, in no way shall you have completely witnessed or completed witnessing to the cities of Israel until the Son of Man has come. <clears throat> the job is continual, right up until the time Jesus returns. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. And it is sufficient for the disciple that he becomes as his teacher and the servant as his master. We are working towards that. If they have called the master of the house bales above, how much more shall they call those of his house, household? Most people in the world won't receive your good news. They won't. They don't want to hear it. It's not your job to continue being in their face about it, so to speak. Because they're not going to hear it. It's not your job. <clears throat> your job is to live as righteously as you can. People can see who you are. And they will either be drawn to you or they won't. If they're drawn to you, then you help them. And you let your light shine further into their life. And hopefully their heart will turn to God. But don't be discouraged by the multitude of people in your life that you encounter that reject what you know and believe. It's just going to happen. Don't be discouraged by that. Therefore, do not fear them, because there is nothing covered that shall not be uncovered. In time, it will. And nothing hidden that shall not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, in this world, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Don't be ashamed of what you know. Be bold when you have to be. Don't back down from what you know and believe. Don't literally stand on the housetops and, <laughs> and check out these messages or on a street corner with signs and whatnot. I mean, that's not, that's not what you're supposed to do at all. Yes. <clears throat> and this is an interesting verse here in verse 28, and we'll come back to this verse towards the end. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but do not have power to destroy the life. Hmm. The body is not the life, but rather fear him who has the power to destroy both life and body 
in the Gehenna fire. So this verse is very revealing in, in a couple of ways. <clears throat> What's different about me right now as compared to, let's say, if I was a corpse? Has the body changed in any way, physically? Somewhat. It's, the body's changed. It's no longer pumping blood. And <laughs> I'm no longer thinking thoughts. <clears throat> But the body is still there, just like it was before I, I passed. What is now gone? The soul. No, your spirit. Spirit. Soul, spirit. Yeah, same thing. Where did it go? Back to God. Back to God. In a little Christmas ornament box. <laughs> yeah, back to God. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see that it actually does go back to God. Mm -hmm. But it's without a body, and it's without consciousness, because you see in Ecclesiastes, the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing. We'll go to Ecclesiastes, but not yet. That is the right answer. <clears throat> because when you die, physically, there's a separation between what... Jesus reveals here life and body. The body is not life. The body is a vessel for life. That's what the body is. It's a vessel. It's a dwelling place for life. It's a very interesting concept. And you can see how people can think that, well, yeah, if the life leaves the body, the body's dead, and then the life continues on somewhere else. Where does it go? They think it's still alive somewhere, conscious somewhere, either in heaven or roaming the earth, troubled spirits, or suffering in hell somewhere. That's what the world thinks. <clears throat> Jesus says, Fear him who can destroy both the life and the body. Which means the life, the spirit, the human spirit that God gives us, not the Holy Spirit, the spirit that God gives us to live, to be who we are, can also be destroyed. It's not an eternal thing. It's not an immortal spirit. Not until God gives it life forever by combining it with His Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit can't die. <clears throat> Man's spirit can die, be destroyed. <coughs> so all who have ever lived on this earth, <clears throat> none so far have had that second death, that, that life that no longer resides in the vessel, the body, has not been destroyed yet. But the potential for that is there in the future. It can be done. Jesus himself says so. So with that little background and that there, we'll because we'll, we'll get into the rest of that in Luke, right at the end of it there. Let's continue in Luke 8, verse 19. <clears throat> Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but were not able to get to him because of the multitude. And it was told him, saying, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. Jesus always takes opportunities like this to teach. And he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are those who are hearing the word of God and are doing what? <clears throat> are doing it. Hearing the word of God and are doing it, this, these people are my family. Not just hearing my word and not doing anything about it. <clears throat> now it came to pass on one of those days that he and his disciples went into a ship. And he said to them, let us go to the other side of the lake. And they put off from the shore. You know, Jesus told them specifically, we're going to the other side. Let's go. Which
which means Jesus expected to get there. They were going to get to the other side. Because this is a test of faith here for these disciples. And then they sailed, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were being filled with water, and were in danger. And I commented on this uh, when we were doing the Harmony of the Gospels, how, how amazing it was that he could sleep through something like that. <laughs> but he did. He was sleeping through this. Then they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing, we're going to die. And he arose, and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he turned to them and said, Where is your faith? Why did he ask them that at that particular time? Where is your faith? There's an implication there. If they had faith, strong enough faith, what might have happened? <clears throat> well, remember how Jesus said, if you have faith as small as this mustard seed, you can say that mountain, remove yourself and cast yourself into the ocean. If they had faith the way Jesus is expecting them to have faith, they didn't need to wake him up at all. They could have used God's power. They could have called upon God, the Father, and rebuked the wind and the seas themselves. And they didn't trust that they would make it safely to the other side either. Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. Jesus fully intended to get there. He wasn't going to die on that ocean, or on that lake, that is. But they didn't know they weren't going to die. They were with Jesus. But they didn't know that they were I know that. Die. That's why Jesus is saying, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Let let's us, let us go there. We're all going to get there, safely. And if you have the, the right faith, you could have rebuked that storm. There wasn't a need to wake me. <clears throat> That's what I get from that. <clears throat> they, they should have, Jesus' demeanor alone should have given them enough comfort. If Jesus himself was not concerned, why would they have any reason to be? Yes, exactly. Jesus was not concerned. I mean, he, he was sleeping. Him. He was sleeping. He must have been really tired. <laughs> yep. I mean, the only way those disciples could have could have died is if they were washed out of the boat, or if the boat flipped. But they know Jesus would have never allowed that to happen. The Father would never allow. Where that to is your faith? God yeah. gave those disciples to <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Yes. He chose them. Yes. He chose them. So we all have important jobs to do as Christians. Not necessarily rebuking storms. I've tried and it didn't, didn't, didn't work. It didn't work. No. <laughs> See, <laughs> the difference in that is... Out two and ticked and it wouldn't yeah. move. <laughs> None of them would. Indeed. Indeed. I've never been able to rebuke a storm either, but... I didn't have Jesus with me needing to get to the other side of a lake either. Eric, don't you think though, um, how I've always interpreted that one particular scripture was uh, metaphorical mountains, the, the mountains in our lives, of the course. obstacles in our lives. Of course. It's not up to us yeah. to change the landscape God created, it's up to no. us to have but, enough faith to say to absolutely. the mountain in our way. Whatever that may be. That is a 100% true statement. Because with faith, you can overcome anything. Yes. Mountains, obstacles, mountains. They seem like mountains. But quite literally also. But it's right? not to God's glory to no, change it isn't. the landscape it isn't. of this earth. Of course it's not. So drastically. Because everyone would be doing it. 
No, no, I know, but it, it has to be according to God's will. Exactly. If it was God's will, and, and that mountain needed to be cast into the ocean for whatever reason that God needed it to be there, any number one of those disciples could do it. And, and that's in the same way, in that particular case yeah. of the storm, they could have rebuked it. Of that course was for the could. sake of a lesson. So what's harder to do, rebuking a storm or healing someone who's sick? We're raising them from the dead. The disciples were able to do that because they had the faith to do that. You know, it was God's will that they were able to do that. Remember, it's these kind of miraculous things are only in accordance with God's will. It's not a sideshow. It's never been a sideshow. If it is God's will that some miraculous thing has to happen through your life, then it will. It happened for several people throughout history. But for the great many of followers, those type of things, it's not necessary for God's will to be shown through your life in, in matters such as that. <clears throat> Yeah. Verse 26, and then they sailed down to the country of the Gadarens, which is across from Galilee. And when he went out on the land, there he met a certain man from the city who had been possessed by demons for a long time, and he was not wearing any clothes, and he did not dwell in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down in front of him and said with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of, of God, the Most High? I beseech you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many times it had seized him, and each time was restrained, being bound with chains and fetters. After breaking the bonds, he was driven by the demon into the desert. It's pretty strong possession here. And Jesus asked it, saying, What is your name? And it said, Legion, because many demons had entered into him. Then it begged him that he would not command them to go away into the abyss. To go away into the abyss. Where is that? What is this abyss that this legion of demons did not want to go to? <clears throat> Where have we heard about that before? The abyss. Revelation 20. Exactly. Revelation 20, also Jude, and also Peter. There's a place of restraint for many demons right now. They're not all loose wandering this earth. Some are. God permits that. Satan's wandering. God permits that. But probably a majority of them are not. Now let's go to uh, 1 Peter first. 1 Peter 3. Where is Peter? Come on. <clears throat> First Peter 3 and in verse 19. By which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. In prison. Okay. We turn to Jude. Jude, the uh, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their own original domain, but deserted their habitation, he is holding in eternal bonds under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. They're somewhere being held in bonds under darkness, waiting for the judgment. A place where Legion was begging Jesus not to send them. Send me anywhere. Send us anywhere. Send us into that herd of swine. Just don't send us into the abyss. We don't want to go there. Please. And then in Revelation, you can see. <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel descending from heaven, having the key of the abyss 
and a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him, just like the others, bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the abyss, and locked him up, and sealed the abyss over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were fulfilled. And after that is ordained that he be loosed for a short time. It is literally a prison, a place of restraint for these angels who left their first domain and followed Satan. Most of them are there right now. Luke, let's go to verse 41. We're going to skip through the part of that. We'll go to verse 41. And behold, a man whose name was Jairus, he was a ruler of the synagogue, and after falling at Jesus' feet, he begged him to come to his house, because his only daughter, about twelve years old, was dying. And as he went, the multitudes were thronging him, and a woman who had been afflicted with a flow of blood for twelve years, and had spent her whole life, or whole living, on physical physicians, pardon me, who had spent her whole living, a lot of money that is, on doctors but could not be cured by anyone, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately the flow of her blood stopped. And Jesus asked, Who touched me? And as everyone began to deny it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes are thronging and pressing you, and you ask, Who touched me? And he was being <clears throat> jostled by a lot of people. And Jesus said, Someone touched me in faith, because I know that power went out from me. He could feel power within him leaving and going into someone else. Then the woman, seeing that her act was not concealed, came trembling, humbly, and afraid. And after falling down in front of him before all the people, she declared for what cause she had touched him and how she had immediately been healed. And he said to her, Be of good courage, daughter, because your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Faith, trust in God, in other words, can accomplish anything in your life. Something as miraculous as being healed, it may not be God's will that happens to you. But as we learned before in the harmony that anything that you spiritually need in your life, with the right faith, you will receive. You will receive. And while he was yet speaking, one came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the master. But hearing this, Jesus answered him, saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she shall be restored. She shall be restored. Only believe. And she shall be restored. <clears throat> That's what we're asked to do also. Is believe in God. And we are restored to a clean state. Without sin. Children of God. <coughs> Belief means more than just, yeah, I, I believe. It means truly doing the will of God. And when he went into the house, he did not allow anyone to go in with him except Peter, James, John, and the father and the mother of the child. And they were all weeping and bewailing. But he said, do not weep. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. <clears throat> Why in the world would he say that? Because she was obviously dead. Jesus had an understanding about death that we don't. But we understand now. But they certainly didn't then. Death, in God's eyes, is not death at all. The first death, that is. The first death is only sleeping because there's a life and there's the body. 
Life and the body are separate things. When the body stops functioning and the life leaves the body, that's the first death. But it's considered just sleeping in God's eyes because the life still exists at that moment. They laughed at him knowing that she was dead. Yeah, she was physically dead. But after putting everyone outside, he took hold of her hand and called out saying, Child, arise. And in verse 55, what does it say? And her spirit returned. Returned from where? Where did it go? It went back to God. And he put her, that spirit back within her body. Now for those who have died <coughs> thousands of years ago, their body is gone. It's long since become soil again. <laughs> It's not that hard for God to recreate a body. And he has that life still with him to put into a new body, which will occur at the second resurrection for those who are resurrected physically. And for those who are resurrected in the first resurrection, they will be given a spirit body. But that life combined with God's Holy Spirit, produces the glorious, godly resurrection. But that life, that spirit, is who you are. It's your life experiences. It's what dwells in your mind. Not in your finger. In your mind. It's a real thing. And it's something that leaves your body upon death and can be returned to your body or returned to a body that God creates again. Death is only sleeping, the first death that is. The second death is not just sleeping. And her spirit returned and she immediately arose and he directed that they give him something to eat yeah. Everybody was amazed. Everybody was amazed. So let's go to Ecclesiastes. Just in closing here. Ecclesiastes. It's an interesting, interesting book, that one. <clears throat> in verse, uh, or chapter 3, that is. In verse 18. I said in my heart, Concerning the matter of the sons of men, may God reveal to them that they may see that they themselves are just beasts. <laughs> we're, just, we're just beasts. <laughs> yeah, my wife will say that sometimes. <laughs> You're a beast. <laughs> For that which happens to the sons of men also happens to the beasts. Even one thing happens to them. As the one dies, so dies the other. Just like every other living thing that God created, we are no different than them in that we die also. So that a man has no advantage over a beast, all is vanity. All go to one place, the grave. All are of the dust, and all return to dust again. The body decays. The world recycles. All the nutrients that reside in your body go back into the soil and plants take it up. Other animals eat those plants. We eat those animals. And we probably got... And we're all connected. And yeah, certain molecules and nutrients from... Well, that's a weird thought, isn't it? But anyway. <laughs> Verse 21 is interesting, though. <clears throat> who knows the spirit of man? Whether it goes upward, who knows? Does any, does any man know? What happens to the spirit of man? Does it go upward? And what about the spirit of the beast? Does it go downward to the earth? 
where do the spirits go? Where does, where does that life that resides in the body, in the physical body, where does it go? Therefore I perceive that there is nothing better that a man should do than to rejoice in his own works, for that in his portion, for who can bring him to see what shall be after him? I mean, God knows where the Spirit goes. And he reveals where it goes in chapter 12. <clears throat> in chapter 12, verse 7. Then the dust shall return to the earth, as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. The Spirit returns to God who gave it, and He holds it and He keeps it safe for when He has the will to reunite it with a body and bring it to life again. Just as Job said all the days, I will wait in my grave until you have a desire for the work of your hand, and you will call and I will hear. You will restore my life again. The Spirit returns to God who gave it, but it is not conscious at that time. Ecclesiastes also says, the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing, <clears throat> but the dead shall rise again. And God can destroy that life too in the fire. And that is called the second death. So there's two choices. There's God as your choice, or there's death as your choice. It's your choice. It's everybody who ever existed on this planet since Adam and Eve until the very last birth before the end. All have a choice. Choose life. Why should you choose death? 